we must continue to stay true to the preaching uh, of the Word of God and not be ashamed. Amen? Not be ashamed. For it's the preaching of the Word that will continue to help us to grow in grace. Preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reproof, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine. And can I just say this to you? Sound doctrine is not only related to the doctrines or the fundamentals of the faith of, as we know them, uh, the virgin birth and salvation by grace through faith and the deity of Christ, although these are good, but let me just say, what about the doctrine of living out the Word of God? Because that's where the rubber meets the road. And uh, a lot of people would like to know the, the doctrines of the faith and stand for them, but when it comes to living out what we know, that's the challenge. That's the true test, if you will, of Christianity. Uh, we can read the book of Acts, but you know, in a sense, uh, we must see the heart or the heartbeat of those that started the church and say, we must continue where they left off. And uh, if all we do is read about their events and not live out the Christian life, then we're just forever learning. Forever learning. But there must be a time where we come to live out the Word of God in our generation today and be an example to our children and the lost and those that are still waiting to hear the gospel. There are people still waiting. I believe in the last days there's a trickling of souls that will come into the fold before Jesus comes. And may God help us be faithful uh, to the Word of God by living it out. Throughout Scripture, we find Christians not only believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, but following the Lord Jesus Christ. You can believe without following. Well, that's not true faith, is it? It's a dead faith. Every Christian that has trusted in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior must have a fervent faith that follows the one they say they believe. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. We're living in a generation where we see many professing Christians, but not practicing Christians. We're living in a generation or an age where we hear a lot of Christianity, but we don't see a lot of Christianity. We're living in an era of many people claiming to have faith in Christ, but not living out their faith. And we're living in a period of time where people say they love Jesus, but they don't live like they do. In our passage before us, we see the Apostle Paul not only profess Christ, but actually live for Christ. Paul not only had faith in Christ, but he was committed in following Christ. Paul not only said that he loved Christ, but he continued to demonstrate that love by obeying Christ for the will of his life. In chapter 1 of this letter, the Apostle Paul says in verse 21, For to me to live is what? Christ, and to die is gain. He writes to the church at Philippi in the beginning of this chapter, thanking them for the support that they simply supported him with, for the gospel's sake, he takes time to encourage them that he's praying for them. He informs them about his current circumstances and how he was in prison and he was being persecuted and suffering. But his attitude was exceptional. Through that time in which he faced a lot of persecutions and sufferings for the living for the cause of Christ, he, had, he didn't have a complaining spirit or a murmuring spirit. He, he didn't have no regrets. As a matter of fact, he was rejoicing and actually saying to the church, rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. It's a man that wrote from prison. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul said that in nothing he shall be ashamed, but rather that he should continue to be a bold witness for Christ. Look at verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I should be ashamed. In nothing I should be ashamed. That, that with... All boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be, made, uh, shall be magnified in my body, whether in what? By life or by what? Death. You know what Paul was talking about here? He was talking about his current 
predicament, his circumstances. To him, his circumstances didn't dictate his life. It was Christ that dictated his life. It was Christ, you know, that, that he was living for. It was very clear that whether he lived or died, that Christ will be magnified. It doesn't matter. It didn't, it, didn't him, it didn't matter. What mattered was that Christ will be lifted up by the life that he lived. That's what he cared about. And this verse leads us to what I will call Paul's life verse and should be our life verse in verse 21. It's a remarkable verse and I want to point out three things from this verse uh, this morning. First of all, a purposeful life. He says, for to me to live is Christ. A purposeful life. A life that is lived with purpose is a life that is lived for Christ. You know, people today want to live in such a way where they want to continue to preserve life and continue to live, but for what purpose? For what avail? Just to survive, eat, drink and be merry and die? What are we living for? Who are we living for? The Apostle Paul says, for to, me, for to me to live is Christ. I mean, there was no doubt this was almost his life verse. Because life does not have true purpose for a Christian if we cannot live it for the cause of Christ. Life is not worth living if we cannot live it for Christ. It's not worth living. What's there to live for if you can't live this life for Christ? What's there to live for? For a Christian? Nothing, really. Because in all that we do should be for the cause of Christ. In everything that we do, whether we work, whether we uh, you know, train up our children, whether we are educated, whatever we do ought to be for the cause of Christ and for the sake of of the gospel. Now, let me just say in the question here, how does living for Christ look like? I mean, for me to live is Christ, but how did it look like for the Apostle Paul and how does it look like for us? What does it mean to live for Christ? Now, it's easy to say, I live for Christ and I live, you know, for Christ and all that I do, but how does it look like? Because someone can say that, right? They can say, that's my life verse. For me to live is Christ, but how does it look like? It's more than just the Christian name, we know that. It's more than just the, you know, ABCs of Christianity of being baptized and, and following the Lord in baptism by water. There's got, it's got to be more than just the ABCs of Christianity, right? How does it look like? Well, first of all, by uh, way of context, number one, to live for Christ is to spread the gospel. Uh, the church at Philippi were no doubt gospel focused. Look at verses three to five. Have a look at verses 3 to 5. The Apostle Paul thanks God for their commitment. He says, I thank my God, verse 3, upon every remembrance of you, always uh, in every prayer of mine for you, all making requests with joy. Why? For, look at verse 5. For your fellowship, your partnership in the gospel from the first day till now. Living for Christ simply means to live, to spread the gospel or to support the gospel in every way, shape or form. The Apostle Paul commended them, if you will, in this epistle for their, uh, you know, support. He thanked God for their support, their partnership. You know, Lydia wanted to support the ministry from the first day she met Paul. It was a blessing. She not only was baptized, you look at that account later on when you can, but she just wanted Paul to be simply coming to, or, and, and those that were with Paul uh, and the team to be, you know, she wasn't ashamed of Paul or his travels or, you know, by the way, let me just say this. She wanted them to be part of her household so she could take care of them even after he was in prison. You may say, oh, persecution didn't come yet. She was, would, have been, would have been, you know, just asking, oh, this is great. No, no, it was after persecution that she received them in her house. You can say, oh, I'm inviting trouble here. No, because from get-go, she was supporting the gospel. She knew and understood what it meant in her life. And so therefore, she wanted now to have a new purpose, not only to be a, a businesswoman, but someone that would live for Christ. And what did that mean? Support the gospel. Someone that would continue to have the heart of the gospel, to continue to uh, push forward and, and go forth and, into the lives of people. Who are you living for? What are you living for? And we understand to live for Christ is to live for the cause uh, of Christ, for the gospel's sake. Paul didn't want the church to be discouraged in his current predicament. Look at verse 12. Look what he says in verse 12. He was in prison. They understood he was in prison. 
He was in prison in Rome under Caesar, by the way, chained to a, a soldier, a Ro Roman sh soldier. But look what he says in verse I would, He says, I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the what? Furtherance of the gospel. Yo, Paul's saying, my predicament in prison is only an extension of the gospel. Don't worry, it's good. Huh? It's good. Yeah, don't worry, don't be sad. Rejoice always in the Lord. My, look, listen, I want you to understand what's going on here. The gospel is pushing out in all the palace. Have a look at verse 13. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without what? Fear. It takes one man to stand and to live for Christ by preaching the gospel. And if that means going to prison so others could be encouraged to keep on keeping on, so be it. That's all Paul wanted. And by the way, that was more than just having a little blog on the internet to promote yourself and your liberties. He, the apostle Paul, was promoting Christ. The gospel, because that's what it meant to live for Christ. It's the gospel's sake. He lived for the gospel's sake. The apostle Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9, to the weak I became as weak that I may gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be a partaker thereof with you. The Apostle Paul gave his life for the gospel's sake. Paul knew it, what he lived for. Living for Christ is to live for the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 9 verse 16 he says, Though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for the necessity is laid on me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. See, the Apostle Paul knew his calling and he knew to live to Christ is to fulfill his calling. To fulfill his calling was to preach the gospel. He didn't do it out of prideful ambition. He says, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory. He understood, but rather from a heart to fulfill his calling and to fulfill his calling, listen, meant that he would live for Christ. In our passage, Paul encourages the church to continue to be gospel focused. Look at verse 27 of chapter 1 only let your conversation only let your conversation be as it becometh the what the gospel of Christ you know what church only let your conversation your lifestyle live and breathe the gospel live out the gospel share the gospel support the gospel for whatever I uh, for, for whether I come or see you or else be absent I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one uh, spirit, with one mind, striving together for the what? For the faith of the what? The gospel. If we're not living, you know, to spread the gospel, then we're not living for Christ. We're not. If we live day by day and we interact with people out there and we're not soul conscious to tell them about Christ, pass out a gospel track, or, you know, just to have, uh, you know, that kind of attitude in the way we live, then we're not really living for Christ. If this church is not being gospel focused, listen, well above the cameras here, for, for this, the church, and it's not going out to the community and spreading the gospel in any way, shape, or form, or anything that we can think on, how we can think and spread the gospel, then we're not really living for Christ. The church at Philippi were the fulfillment of the Great Commission, and the Apostle Paul was encouraging him to continue. Only let your conversation, your lifestyle, surrounded by the gospel, for the faith of the gospel, in one spirit, in one mind, striving together as a team, going forward. How does living for Christ look like? Well, it's living to spread the gospel. Second of all, it's to live a sacrificial life, motivated by love. The Apostle Paul had the heart of God. There's no doubt about that. And we see it because he spent his life living for others. Look at verse 21. For, me, for to me to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Verse 22. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I choose I want not, for I am straight betwixt the two, having a desire to part to be with Christ, which is far better. But look at the verse 24. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for who? 
Me? Did Paul say that? No. For you. See, the Apostle Paul lived for others. And to live to Christ or for Christ means to live for others. It doesn't mean to live for self. The Bible doesn't say here that the Apostle said, for me to live is Paul. No, he says, for to me to live is Christ and to live for Christ is to live for others. I mean, you know, Paul trained up faithful men to have the same mindset. You know, people, once again, they're preserving life. How can I preserve my life? How can I survive? Well, how, well, why don't you think about how you can survive, listen, to serve God by serving others? <laughs> because if you can't live serving God and others, and you just want us to live serving self, well, that's not a good life lived. That's a life that is selfish, not selfless. That's not the mind of Christ, and we'll get there in a moment. But have a look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. The Apostle Paul trained up this young man uh, called Timothy, a young man in the faith, what a remarkable attitude that this Timothy, this Christian, this you know, young Christian that was being trained up to have the mind of not the Apostle Paul only, but the mind of Christ. Look at verse 19, he says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who naturally care for your state. For all seek their what? Own, not the things which are what? Jesus Christ. So how do you, for the things that are Jesus Christ, in reality, are things that are sought for others. If, you know, this cup of water in Christ's name, if you give it to somebody, it's a blessing. In Christ's name, doing it for Christ, but yet... Uh, serving others, loving others, naturally caring for you. For all those, and he's talking about context ministers, for all seek their own. So many ministers today living for themselves. You say, who are they? Well, many, many in our day. Why? Because we're living in a very selfish culture. Very selfish culture. We heard it last week, perilous times shall come. P people be lovers of self more than lovers of God. Trying to preserve life for self, for self, for self, for self, for self, instead of preserving life to live for others. That's what it means to live for Christ or to Christ. Amen? We must have that mindset in the capacity or the responsibility in the measure of faith and talents that God has gifted us. Verse, look, at, look what he says. He continues to say in verse 22, but ye know the proof of him... That, is, that as a son with the father, he had served with me in the what? Wow. Let's not forget the gospel, amen? We're not putting the gospel aside just so we can serve others. It's not humanitarian aid here. Let me just say this to you. Serving others with food and, and all that is good, but hey, make sure the gospel's there. Because if all you do is try to help the poor without giving them the gospel, you really have helped them to live longer and go to hell. Amen, Anthony? Yeah, the key is the gospel, but serving others is simply being there for them and loving them and caring for them in the realm of the gospel, not on the, not on the expense of the gospel. Lot of, even the world today will love you to do humanitarian aid. I mean, I guarantee you, if we're outside serving the community and our church was going out giving food, oh, the police will probably come and join us. But because we are gospel preachers and gospel focus and we preach on sin and repentance, that's the problem. That's the problem. But I guarantee if our church was mainstream and just helping the community without the gospel being the focus, our community will love us. <laughs> Would be one of the best known church around. But listen, brethren, we want to know, we want to be known because of the gospel and the gospel, and not only this, but Serving others is because of the gospel. He says, no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Not only this, but Epaphroditus was another man. Epaphroditus was known as a messenger of the church at Philippi. It could be that he was the pastor of the church. Nevertheless, he was their servant. He served the church at Philippi and uh, Epaphroditus was sent from Philippi to, be, uh, to bring a bundle of uh, supplies to the Apostle Paul, he was in prison and he was waiting some things that the church at Philippi uh, you know, just simply didn't cover. The church of Philippi was supporting the Apostle Paul from get-go, even till now, but there were some things that he was lacking and so Epaphroditus 
travels from Philippi all the way to Rome to just bring Paul some relief. And I want you to see this, talking about serving others, living for others. Look at verse 25. And he says, yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Look, look, what, look at the names that he calls it. Number one, my brother. Number two, my companion and companion. Number three, in labor. Look at this, my fellow soldier. All these are descriptives, by the way. Brother, brotherly love. My companion in labor. He, you know, working in, uh, together. Fellow soldier, warring together. Knowing all these are descriptive. Because the Christian life is not a walk in the park. Amen? But your messenger and he that ministered to my what? Wants or his needs. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. Why was he sick? Because he traveled to get to Paul and relieve Paul. He cared about Paul, the minister of the gospel, so he may continue to do what God has called him to do, for we are laborers together with God. Verse 27, for indeed he was sick nigh unto death. But look at this, but God had mercy on him, not on him only, but also on, uh, on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. This gives us a good indication that the apostle Paul was suffering, but yet rejoicing. And whatever Epaphroditus had would have been just some relief. Amen. And, uh, and look at verse 28. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice and that I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in, what's that word there? Reputation. Reputation. Which very little regarded today. Because men like this that give their life for the cause of Christ and for the sake of the gospel and who are willing to die for the cause of Christ and the, are really just undermined in society. Listen, and in some churches today. But over here he says, high, hold him in a high reputation. In other words, take care of him. Look at verse 30. Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death. What was the work of Christ? Or living for others? Was Epaphroditus living for himself? No. But look at this. Not regarding his life. He didn't care about his life. He risked his life. He laid down his life. Why? To supply your lack of service toward me. What the church couldn't fulfill, Epaphroditus put his hand up and says, I'll go and continue to be a, a, a blessing to Paul. Wow! <laughs> and by the way, Paul received that blessing. It's okay to receive blessing. Thank God for it. Thank God for it. By the way, the body of Christ is in harmony and working together to fulfill the will of God. Praise God for that. And Paul encourages the church to grow in their sacrificial love for others. Have a look, go back to chapter 1. Look at this. He wants them to also have this heart, this mind. And uh, look at verse 9. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. See, I want your love to not only be where it is, but to continue to grow. Increase. Abound means to grow and continue to grow in knowledge. What does that mean? Well, it's not just a kind of, you know, uh, sentimental love. Biblical, listen, biblical love is not sentimental. So it's not just words. I love you. It's not just a feeling. It's more than that. It's, it, it, it's not just governed by feelings. It follows by sacrificial commitment. And, uh, and we know this by looking at scripture. Biblical love is a love that reflects the Savior, and being willing, listen, to sacrifice or lay down your life for others. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And he goes on to say that greater love have no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And, amen? What kind of love is this? Well, it's not, see you later, I'm out of here, love. It's a love that's willing to lay down your life for others. That is biblical love. There's no greater love than this. It's Christ-like love. It's the Savior's love. I mean, this verse makes me think of two uh, couples called a, uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila. 
The Bible says, it, and, and, and Paul giving them thanks, writing his last le uh, letter to the Romans, uh, uh, chapter 16, he goes, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks. Wow! People that were willing to live a Christ-like love by laying down their own life for others. Did they do it so the Apostle Paul can live longer? No, they did it so the Apostle Paul can fulfill his ministry. Biblical love is a love that sacrifices. Paul says to the Ephesians, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also have loved us, and have given himself for us as an offering, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. He says, imitate God. Be imitators of uh, of God as the children walk in love. How's it look like? Christ-like. Laid down his life. And God was well pleased with that sacrifice. It was a sweet smelling savor. Why? Because he laid it down for who? Himself or others? Others. Biblical love is to have the mind of Christ. We see it clearly there in chapter number two. Have a look very quickly. Ephesians, uh, Philippians chapter number two. And look at verses 1 to 8 here. The Apostle Paul continues to encourage the church at Philippi with this in this chapter. He says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if there uh, be uh, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any bows and mercies, look at this, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded and having the same, what? Love. Being of one accord, one mind. Look at this, verse 3. Let nothing be done through what? Strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than himself. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Look at this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in who? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. What kind of love? Well, it was a selfless love. Christ thought, yes, the will of God, but the will of God was simply to live for others. He was the perfect example of one that lived for others. The Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. As I look to Christ, you look to Christ. How did Christ not only, uh, you know, preach? How did he live? How did he live? You just have to trace his life in the four Gospels and you see how he lived. Others, others, others. He lived for others. Now, how does this living for others look like? Spreading the Gospel. Sacrificial love. But this is not a popular, brethren. This is not popular, but it's in our passage. Anyone can take a guess? Living and being willing to Suffer. Suffer. It's in our passage. It's clearly in our passage. Verse 27, he talks to them about living in unity for the, for, the, for the faith of the gospel. But look at what he says in the next verse, verse 28. And in nothing, be, nothing terrified by who? Your adversaries, your opponents, your enemies, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but what? But also to what? Suffer for his sake. And then he goes on to say, have the same conflict which you see in me and now he to be in me. What do you mean the apostle Paul? Have the same conflict? The same sufferings and sorrows that you're having? To suffer? Yes. Because if you're living to Christ, or for Christ, for, for to me to live is Christ, means a life of suffering. But to the disciples and the early disciples, listen, it was a privilege that they would be willing, uh, you know, uh, uh, worthy, excuse me, to suffer for his name. So, like, listen, they weren't rejoicing because of the suffering. Who rejoices because of suffering and persecution? It, it's no, there's no rejoicing there. As a matter of fact, it's a threat to your life. 
He says, this is, this is why the whole purpose, when you strive together for the, for the faith of the gospel, don't be afraid of your adversaries. Don't be terrified by them, because naturally you will. But if you understand this, that Christ suffered, Paul suffered, you will suffer if you live for Christ. And if you do say, hey, for me to live is Christ, you will suffer. A Christianity without suffering is, what? is not Christianity. You will experience some suffering in your Christian life one way or another, depending where you are and what era you live in. But a lot of people want to bypass suffering. And well, no one wants to invite suffering. Do you want to invite suffering? No. But if you live to Christ, you will suffer. There's, you know, there's, you know talk, talking about losing your liberties. Well, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, I'm crucified, I'm dead, and therefore I'm, I, I suffer because of my ambitions. I no longer uh, uh, want to do the things that I used to do as the old man. That's suffering because I want to. There, I, I cannot go to the places which the world goes to and desires to go to. Uh, as therefore I'm restricted and it's a narrow path and I'm suffering. Yes! We spoke about this, about Asaph, how he saw the prosperity of the wicked. Yes, our liberty as Christians have been taken away than, more than anybody. But listen, liberty in Christ is the best thing. You're free. All these things that we think are liberating are bondage. They keep you in bondage. You can be in a cell, I guarantee you, living for Christ, suffering because of Christ, and you could be free. But people don't understand that because they're always trying to sidestep suffering and persecution. May God help us in these last days to continue to live to Christ, knowing that if we do, we will suffer. Why? Because that's what the gospel brings. That's what, when you live for the sake of the gospel, that's what happens. Someone once said, one cannot truly live unless he knows what he is willing to die for. What are you willing to die for? Just your liberty? Freedom of speech, but why freedom of speech? So you can criticize and have your opinion, or so you can preach Christ? Why freedom of speech? For what purpose and what avail? So you can promote yourself or Christ? Do you cringe because they're gagging you? Or do you cringe because they're taking away our liberty to preach Christ? And live Christ. May God help us understand what we are really and truly living for and dying for. We live in a time where it's frivolous Christianity. Too much preaching going on, but not enough practicing. You know what absolutely disgusts me in my own life? I tell you this, when I don't live out the preaching that I preach myself, I'm sick of hearing it. Live for Christ, give your Christ, higher ground, surrender all. But we're just trying to escape the suffering. How's it look like in our day to day? Oh, Romans 13 is embraced by the cream of the crop of Christians today, your theologians. And all pious that we are obeying the government because that's what God wants us to do. Well, what about obeying God? Oh, but if we do that, we'll be in trouble. Huh. Welcome to the Christian country. A lot of people in different countries, if they even thought about what Christians are doing today, would be so sad. And yet, I believe at the same time, disgusted at their cowardness that they can't even stand for Christ and live out the things that belong to God may God help every single one of us from wisdom from God to know how to live as Christians to live for Christ 
For me to live is Christ. It's not for me to live is Charlie. For me to live is Christ. It's easy for me to live is Charlie. Easy. But the sacrificial life that God wants me to live is for Christ. And to live for Christ is to live for others. Now this second part, not only the purpose for life, but look at the second part of verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and what? To die is what? Gain a promotional death. (laughs) Oh, brother. Can you say that? Can you say right now to die is a prophet? Today is a promotion. To die is a promotion for me. You know what the Apostle Paul was trying to say? Listen, church, I'm living for Christ. And living for Christ means I'm living for you. But if I die, it's gain for me. Listen, don't think it's a loss. I'm not losing if I die. If my life is taken because I'm living for Christ, it's a gain. Can you understand that? It's gain. It's not a loss. Sometimes when things are done for the cause of Christ, people say, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you know, and, 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 they, and I understand that. They, they, they're feeling the sorrow that's taken place uh, because of the persecution perhaps that takes place. You know, especially our perhaps brethren that we don't know in Afghanistan. Our heart kind of, oh. But in reality, if they end up dying, it's a promotion for them. As hard as it is, brethren. As hard as it is to the mind of a man that he cannot comprehend. But what Paul is saying is, listen, for me to die is gain. It's a profit. And why could he say this? Because he understood that he was saved. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3 verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven. (laughs) He says, from whence we look for a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he's able to subdue all things unto himself. The apostle Paul knew that when, if he dies or when Christ comes, listen, my body is going to be changed into his glorious body. It's prophet. I'm saved. I'm just not going to the grave. I'm going to be raised up one day. And he could say that because of the resurrection. And he believed in the resurrection. He believed the gospel. You say, what was the proof? Listen, he lived it. He was living proof. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Leave your finger there and go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. I want you to see something from 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul knew he was a saved man. And he knew he was a saved man because he knew the grace of God upon his life. Look at verse 9. Who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. And what? Grace. Which was given uh, given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the what? Gospel. He says, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles, for which cause I also, what's that word there? Suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not a what? Ashamed. Why aren't you ashamed, Paul? Why aren't you ashamed that when you live out your calling and you live to Christ and you live for others and you get persecuted and you're put in prison, why aren't you ashamed? For I know who I believe. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. That's why. He not only believed in uh, his salvation, but he believed that he was secure. He, He was persuaded that God was able to raise him up on that day. And indeed, this is what kept him going. The salvation that was in Christ, the security found in Christ. But listen, most of all, I want you to see something here. The Savior that he was going to be with one day. That's, you know, that, by the way, that's what salvation is all about. That when he comes again, let your heart not be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. For in my father's house there are many mansions. If I were not so, I would have told you. Isn't that a promise? 
And he says, when I come back again, I will receive you unto myself. You know, that's salvation. It's to be where God is. I mean, that's rest. That's comfort. To know. Look at, go back, Philippians 1.23. I want you to see it from our text. To know that to die is gain is because not only my salvation is secure in Christ, but listen, we're going to be with the Savior. What a, what a blessed day that will be. What a day that will be. That you close your eyes and you open them and you're in the presence of God. Wow. Look, notice what he says. This is in our text. He says, For I am straight betwixt the two, I having a desire to depart. What do you mean a desire to depart? Paul? Yeah, my departure's at hand. I want to go. I'm not trying to preserve my life. Hey, listen, once my course and my duty is finished and I've fought a good fight, listen, my departure's at hand. I'm going. My time's up. And listen, don't worry, it's good. I have a desire to be with the Lord. Where's that Christianity, brethren? Where's the Christianity that says, Lord, let me finish my life in, in, in living uh, for you and living for others. And when my time is up, you say time. By the way, God says time's up. Did you know? God's the one that says time's up. He says, I'm straight betwixt the two, having a desire to part to be with Christ, which is what? Which is better. Far better. <laughs> it doesn't even compare. Far better. To be in heaven, to die, is gain. To be with Christ, far better than living here on earth. Yeah, absolutely. If you haven't come to that terms, maybe you need a saviour. Amen? Or maybe you need to walk in the spirit. Amen? Maybe you need to experience what it means to be filled with the spirit of God and the fruit of the spirit governing your life and saying, Lord, come quickly. And you know, and understand that he's, uh, before he comes, you occupy till he comes. This is what it's all about. Paul the Apostle says to the Corinthians, being confident, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body is to be what? Present, Present with the Lord. You know, this, this was Paul's, one, of, one of Paul's motivating factors. This, this is what, what kept Paul going. And I want you to see it from 2 Corinthians 5. Just quickly, have a look at 2 Corinthians 5. I want you to see this. I think one of the saddest things in leaving earth would be missing our loved ones. But yeah, I think that's probably one of the saddest things. But Paul dealt with that in 1 Thessalonians 4. Your loved ones that are in Christ, you'll see again. Where? At the resurrection. <laughs> Amen. And you'll be re reunited with them in the air with the Lord. Praise God for that. But I think that's one of the saddest things. It's not so we can finish what we wanted to do or we haven't, uh, you know, completed our bucket list. Listen, your bucket list doesn't compare to what God has planned in heaven. But Christians are so frivolous and chasing after, living after the wrong things here today. That's why they don't understand what they have in Christ. True riches. That's why Moses says, I'd rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Bearing the, remo re the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures that he had in Egypt. You know, Moses had treasures in Egypt and he knew that step of faith. If he was going to go and say, no, nah, I'm done. No longer want the world. No longer want Egypt. No more uh, prosperity. No more uh, this position and this, this, this prominent uh, position, I'm, I'm done with it. He knew what was coming. And when you're done and you say, I, I want to live to Christ, I want to live for Christ, really what you're saying, I'm done with this world. I, really, I am, I'm just really not going to be entangled with the affairs of this life. What was the motivating factor? Look, have a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Number 1, from verses 1 to 8, Paul was motivated by looking to be in the presence of God. Verse 8, we are confident. I say and willing rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What a great motivation, amen? Number 2 from verses 9 to 10, Paul was motivated to please the Lord. Look what he says, wherefore we labor that whether we be present or absent, we may be accepted of him. 
For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone must, may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You know, the Apostle Paul was motivated by the fact that we want to be accepted by him. You know, there's nothing uh, more satisfying than to know that when you've finished your course, that God was pleased. Well done, my good and faithful servant. I don't know about you, but that's heaven to me. That's my reward. To know that when I finish the end of the road, that God was pleased. It says, number three, verse 11, Paul was motivated by the person of the Lord. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Wow. Motivated by the fact that, you know, when it comes to judgment day, see you later, my friend. That's when the reckoning comes. A lot of, lot of people are going to sit in regret. Knowing the terror of the Lord, you know, God is a just God. He will deal with the ignorant and the arrogant. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is this. The ignorant have a lesser punishment than the arrogant. You say, why? To whom much is given, much is what? Required. Listen, brethren, the more we know and the more we look into things and the more we hear preaching, the more you and I are accountable to live out what we know. Thank God we will not be judged for our sin, but we will be judged for our service. And so number four, from verses 12 to 13, Paul was motivated by the people of the Lord, whom he served. He says, for we commend ourselves, uh, we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. Look at verse 13, for whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. What do you mean, beside ourselves? Well, people thought that the apostles were just maybe just loony tunes. <laughs> Losing it. Well, if you think we're crazy because of the life that we're living and we're wasting it, we know that there's a re resurrection, by the way. Uh, we're not fighting beasts for nothing. We're not giving our lives for the cause of Christ for nothing. We're doing it for God. We're laying our life for... If we're sober, it's for your cause. What motivated him? Well, the fact that he was living for others. And not only this, but have a look. I think this takes the cream of the crop, but the superior motivation that drove Paul to do all that he did for Christ was the passion of the Lord. He says, for the love of Christ, in verse 14, constrains us. What keeps you going, Paul? God's love for me. You know what he was doing? He was promoting the gospel here. The reason why I do what I do is because of the gospel. Very clearly, he says, here, the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Look, listen, if Christ didn't do what he did, then we'll all be finished. No hope. I'm judging this. And if he didn't die for all, we'd have no hope. We're all dead. But he, but he says very clearly, then we're all dead that he died for all that they which what? Live. Those that have believed, those that have put their faith in Christ should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. From the day you believe on Christ, henceforth don't live for yourself, but live for him that died for you. How? The love of Christ. He died for me. Can't I live for him? And this is, this is it, brethren. The world doesn't want you to live for him. And, the, and, and, and Jesus said, a servant is not greater than the master. They hated me, they're going to hate you. Listen, there's nothing new under the sun. This pandemic is an opportunity for the wicked to get at God and his people. I've always said it. This is the opportunity. How can we get to the Christians? This is it. I was jokingly saying several months after all this happened within our church, I was saying, man, I can't sneeze without getting in trouble because I had all eyes watching me, man. I was just saying that to the men here. I mean, I felt that I couldn't even breathe or move without getting in trouble. And then one day we were soul winning in Cardiff and I went to uh, Coles to buy a few things and, uh, oh, no, there was a sneeze that was building up. <sighs> All of a sudden, I, I, I couldn't hold it, and I left, had to let it out, and I went, <sighs> got my stuff and ran out. 
and then went back to my spot and started handing out gospel tracts and one guy came out of Coles and he says, I saw you in Coles sneezing on everybody. Oh, really? I was in Coles sneezing on everybody. I, sn- I sneezed in my elbow. You can't even sneeze in your elbow anymore, can you? Look, listen, this is an opportunity for people just to get at the Christians. Just to, uh, just yeah, their liberties. To get at their liberties. You can't even move without someone trying to uh, trap you. Why? Because you're living out the gospel. Why? Because you're encouraging people to live out the gospel. What does it mean for me? If Pastor Charlie's encouraging my family and my friends, that means I've got to give my life. Then what's wrong with that? But this is the preaching that people don't want to hear. Because they want to preserve life. How many years you got left? Seven years when, before Jesus comes? Eat, drink and die. Or at least die with dignity and courage and boldness knowing that you did all that God wanted you to do. This is the Christianity that we live in today. People want to live out the book of Acts and its wonders and its signs but not in its suffering. This is the Christianity that we have today. The charismatic movement is the charismatic curse that wants to bring lights, camera and action in a very, uh, you know, conservative way. But when it comes to go and stand courageously to speak in the face of persecution, they cower and run like little pussycats. May God help us with men of God that not only bold on this pulpit, but bold in preaching Christ unto their death. Every single one that died as a martyr died for the cause of Christ. And those that died for themselves lived a life that was shameful. And you know what? Eternity will only bring it to pass. God will make all things that are hidden to light and make it manifest. Brethren, don't be ashamed at his coming. Don't be ashamed at his coming. Look at there's a day where you will lose everything. It's coming. But you tell me what Christian that lived to, for Christ in his generation didn't lose. We see the greatest paradox. He that will save his life will lose it. But he that gives his life will save it. You say, is this works based? No, it's an outflow of a true Christian that wants to live for Christ. True disciple. Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Good on you. He didn't say good on you, did he? He just simply says, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have nowhere to lay his head. You know what it means to follow Christ? Suffering and sacrifice. Lord, let me, I'll follow you, but let me first go bid well, uh, go, let me go bury my father. Let the dead bury their dead and go preach the kingdom of God. You, come, follow me. I'll, I'll, I'll come, but let me go bid them farewell that are at my house. Listen, whoever puts their hands on the plow looking back, not turning back, is not fit for the kingdom of God. We preach this, but listen, when's the time to live this? You see, you look at this and say, how's this supposed to be lived out today in our era? When this first happened last year, one of the brothers came up to me and says, you've got a family, brother Charlie. You got family, kids, wife. You can't afford to go to prison. You know what you were telling me? You're telling me I can't afford to live to Christ. Listen, don't put that in my head. I'm already struggling. I need encouragement to say you do what God's called you to do and God will be with you. And brethren, I say the same thing to you. Whatever God's called you to do, you do it and God be with you. Yes. God be with you. God give you the grace and wisdom to live to Christ, knowing to die is a promotion, it's gain. But listen, let me say this to you in closing. He says, for to me to live, it's a personal choice. Me. I'm not living out someone else's Christian life, I'm living my Christian life. Listen, you need to live out your Christian life, but not on the expense of everything that we just heard about what it means to live for Christ. Spreading the gospel, sacrificial love, living for others, and suffering for the cause of Christ. Remember, these three have to be in your equation in living for Christ. 
It's a personal choice that you have to make, but knowing, hey, listen, these are potentially the things that accompany my calling, my gifts, and the measure of faith that God has given me. You may not die like the Apostle Paul or like John the Baptist. But you have to be willing to die and say, God, I'm willing to go in any which way you want me to go. It's a personal choice. I'm willing not only to live for you, but to die, whatever the cost. Because that's what true Christianity is about. You know, Moses gave a similar challenge to the people that were worshipping the golden calf. Remember that time when he came down from Mount Sinai and he found the people? Even Aaron, listen, even Aaron going to idolatry. Aaron, his own brother that was with him. You say, what happened? He saw Aaron was encouraged to build a golden calf and Moses came down and simply said, who is on the Lord's side? And we have a whole heap of people that came in. I don't want anything to do with his idol worship. And the rest were destroyed. Joshua said, choose you this day. Who will you choose in serving? Who will you serve? Choose you this day. Who are you going to serve? The famous quote for me in my house, we'll serve the Lord. That's the, fa that's the famous quote that we see it on walls, houses, at, in the, at the front door of Christian homes. But listen, let it be edged in your heart here today. Serving the Lord doesn't mean sitting down doing nothing and waiting. The persecution is going to be, listen, the furnace is going to be heated up. You understand that? Through much tribulation will enter the kingdom of heaven. Who ever thought, brethren... Who ever thought that the day will come when we said, oh, remember that time we'll pray, we said, thank you, Lord, that we can meet without persecution? Who ever thought that now we have to pray and say, God, protect us from persecution and from the police so we can continue to uh, do what you've called us to do? Who ever thought we'd live in that day? So when you see it coming, when you see it happening, no, it's not going to let, it's going to continue. This is a foothold. This is only the beginning. Elijah said, how long? Hold ye between two opinions. If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. When are you going to make up your mind? Hello again. Who are you following? Who? For me to live is Charlie or no? For to me to live is Christ. And that's the battle that I fight every day, brethren. And Jesus said it very clearly, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and let him take up his cross weekly, daily. Amen. And follow me. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot. So who are you serving? Is your master Jesus or is your master money? The truth is everyone is living for something, isn't there? Everybody, position, possession, power, pride. What did Jesus say to that man in the parable that was living for himself and living for the here and now? What did Jesus say? What did the Lord say to him? He called him your fool. Remember that parable? He says, you fool. This night thy soul could be required of thee. And then whose these things be which thou provideth? You're storing up moths in your barn. This is what I'll do. I'll store up much goods. Living for the here and now. And people are living to store up goods to survive for what avail? If to live for Christ, good. But to preserve life, then all these things, who are they going to be for? Paul says, for to me to live is Christ. Now how could Paul say this and love, you know, not his life unto death? How? 
Because that's what the martyrs did. If you re read Revelation, they loved not their lives unto death. How can you say this? We saw all those motivations, right, in 2 uh, uh, Corinthians 5. But there's another motivation here, which is, goes hand in hand with the one that takes the cream of the crop. The love of Christ, and there's something else here I want you to see in our main passage. Philippians chapter 1, have a look. We're almost done. We started with this verse, and we'll finish with this verse. Have a look. Now, according, he says in verse 20, look at this. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. Listen, whether it be by life, listen, or death. It doesn't matter whether I live or die. Listen, by the life that I live, I want God to get the glory. What a motivation. What a motivation. Lord, I'm not doing this so I can be famous preacher that got arrested for the cause of Christ. Little do people know. Lord, I want you to be glorified among the heathen. And I want the people to know that you're more than essential. That's what I want. I cannot stand to hear it. You're not essential. Who said? Caesar? God haters? Carnal Christians? By the life I live and by the death I die, I want it to say, God is more than essential. He be magnified. Listen, because he's the giver of life. Without him we have nothing. And I want God to be glorified. And I pray that you would live a life that would want God to be glorified in all that you do. Not be ashamed. Amen? Let's pray.